start today's lecture. So good morning everyone and today we're going to talk about prokaryotic transcription. Uh, some of this sh should be a review of what you already also learned in principles of biology so hopefully it won't be too hard for you guys but if I go fast and you're falling behind just ask a question. Um, I welcome your questions during the, the lecture. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with this slide um, just to reiterate that we really want you guys to do your work continuously throughout the semester, right? And I said, okay, if you want to do better in MCB, what you want to do is you want to do your reading, lecture, study questions, and recitations over the course of the semester. Your learning curve is going to look something like this, right? But if you don't do anything before midterms and then study right before, then your curve is going to look like this, your study, and reflecting your studying, your learning. So here is the uh, actual data from NYU classes showing you the access to NYU classes site and the usage of the materials. And what you can see, which of these curves does this uh, real data resemble? Red one or blue one? Right? I think it resembles a little bit of this, suggesting that you guys are really not keeping up. I know that most of you here are good because you actually came to the lecture, right? Some of you guys listening to my voice, um, uh, you should take into consideration that maybe you should also come to the lecture. It's also hard to learn things by listening. I listened to Professor Siegel's flip lecture video, and you know what I was doing? I was checking my emails, and I was like listening, and I, at the end I'm like, oh, what did he say? And I missed the whole five minutes, right? So it's actually better to come to lecture and try pay attention. All right. Um, okay, so... What's today's lecture about? We talked about genomes, and we said the genomes are basically the information, and we said how is that information stored, how is that information packaged and uh, inherited, and in this lecture we're going to learn about how is that information interpreted. Right? How do you use that information to create all these organisms that we see uh, around us? So. Basically, you can think of it like this. You can think of that the kinds and amounts of the functional products will build a particular cell type and ultimately a whole organism. And the reason why our children don't look like these cute kittens is because they express an, uh, different kinds and amounts of functional products in their body, eventually developing into humans rather than cats, right? And so one thing that you should note is that the genome for example, in these humans, right, human children, the genome in their eyes is exactly the, eye, the cells that make up the retina, for example, are exactly the same as the genome in their skin cells, right? So within an organism, the difference in between tissue types and also, uh, is also due to the interpretation of the genome to be different in the different tissue types, right? So you have the same genome in different cells, but the interpretation is different. How does that interpretation work? That is what we call uh, gene expression and gene regulation. So gene expression is basically the process by which the information from a gene the genome is used to make a product, right? So in our chromosomes, we have this string of ATGCs, and they make up these proteins. That's what gene expression is. Gene regulation is regulation of when, where, and how much a certain gene product is going to be made, okay? So that's the terms, uh, the definition of the terms that you're going to hear a lot, gene expression and gene regulation. All right, the first step of gene regulation involves a process that you already heard of, which is the transcription of DNA into RNA. So you're going to have the transcription process copying this information into the RNA molecule. So the, the, we're going to talk about prokaryotic transcription, which has three stages, uh, which involve transcription initiation, elongation, and termination. <coughs> 
In the initiation stage, what you have is you have a promoter sequence here that is the sequence just upstream of the transcription start site that contains the information necessary for the proteins to come and bind it. And you're going to have your RNA polymerase coming to the start site. Uh, it binds to the polymerase uh, uh, in a form which we call the closed complex when both DNA strands are closed. Okay, so they're, they're bound, the complex is bound to the duplex DNA. And then the polymerase melts the duplex DNA near the transcription start site, forming this transcription bubble. And this is a very stable complex, which we call the open complex. You have the DNA strands open. And then you uh, have the start of the RNA polymerase catalyzing the phosphodiester linkage of the two initial RNTPs to start the transcription initiation right at this green dot. All right. So a little bit more about the promoter structure. You've already seen this before, just a review. What we have is we have the first nucleotide where the transcription starts, and we note this as plus one nucleotide. The nucleotides that are being transcribed uh, downstream of the transcription start site, we call it downstream, and these are um, depicted as plus 10, plus 20, etc. And the nucleotides that are uh, uh, in the promoter and upstream are depicted as minus 30, minus 20, minus 10. And these sequences here are the promoter sequences. And you, uh, you have a template strand here, the this, this sequence of the template strand where the RNA polymerase is going to use to copy the, the sequence. And the, down template, uh, the, the sequence of the non-template strand is complementary to the sequence of the template strand, and this is the sequence of the RNA. It is going to resemble the non-template strand sequence, except that you're going to have uracil instead of thymine. Thymidine. All right, so the machinery that does this transcription is shown here in prokaryotes. This is uh, it's just a cartoon. Um, you have um, uh, these uh, protein, um, proteins, they make up this RNA polymerase. Whenever there is a protein complex that are made up of multiple proteins, we call each of these a subunit, right? So these are the subunit of the RNA polymerase. Shown here, the, the, the cartoons of polymerases are shown like this because polymerases have this amazing structure that looks like a hand, okay? And the, the nucleotides are holed in between the, the fingers and the thumb. That's why a lot of the cartoons you're going to see look like that. So you have in RNA polymerases two large subunits, beta and beta prime. So the beta prime is the, the re region of the RNA polymerase that where the catalysis of the nucleotides occur. And then you have two alpha, sub, uh, two alpha subunits, and these are important for keeping this complex together. So it's important for the stability of the complex. And then uh, they also bind to the DNA sequences at the promoter. And they also interact with these transcription factors, which we, which we call activators, because they activate transcription. And then you have these, uh, this omega subunit, which is important for enzyme stability. And the DNA looks something like this. And is this a, a closed or an open complex structure here? Open, because you can see the transcription bubble happen. The DNA strands are open. All right, so we call this uh, beta, beta prime, alpha 2, and omega complex the core enzyme. So this is the machinery that can catalyze the RNA synthesis, but it cannot find the promoter on its own. If it's not directed to a certain region of the genome, it has, uh, um, it, it's not going to be able to go and bind to the promoters and start transcription on its own. What it needs, it, it needs a basal transcription factor. It's a general transcription factor, which we call the sigma factor. And the sigma factor is going to tell the core enzyme where to start the transcription. And the way that it's doing this is that sigma factor is a protein that has protein sequences that recognize the DNA sequence and bind at the promoters at these two locations, at minus 35 and minus 10. 
So the sigma factor plus the core enzyme, which we call now the holoenzyme, this is the enzyme complex that can find the promoter. Right? Okay. So the whole holoenzyme with the sigma factor covers, which binds to sequences between minus 50 to min, uh, plus 20, but only the consensus sequence here are sequence-specific recognition. The binding elsewhere is not dependent on the sequence, it just recognizes DNA shape. Okay? So what does sigma factor do? Sigma factor, the way it interacts with the polymerase, positions the polymerase so that its active site coincides with the plus one, so it can start the transcription at the right sp spot. All right, so how do we know that there are actually sequences that sigma factor recognizes? So what the researchers have done is they took the E. coli genome, which is a great model to study prokaryotic transcription, and they said, let's take all the strong promoters from genes that we know are expressed highly. So strong promoters are promoters that support high transcription. Okay, that's why they're called strong. They say, okay, here are some genes that we know are expressed highly, so they must have strong promoters. Let's line up all of these sequences at their promoters at the transcription start site, so that's the plus one. And then look for DNA sequences that are common to all of these promoters, okay? And when you do that, what you see is you see these regions which have these sequences. You tend to have a TTG followed by an ACA and a T. It's not perfect, but this is what you find mostly. Okay? And then you find these sequences again at the minus 10, but the intervening sequences were mostly different, uh, different from each other, right? So there is no common sequence, sequences from that. So... Um, that's what they found. And in the weak promoters, weak promoters are promoters that can support less transcription. What they found is that the sequences of the weak promoters at these regions, at minus 35 and minus 10, deviates from this sequence, okay? Deviates from the consensus. All right, what's consensus? So consensus is nowadays defined as something U.S. Congress cannot achieve, right? <laughs> But in molecular biology, it is defined as the sequence that you find a common. For example, if I'm going around this room and asking for consensus, and I ask, do you love MCB1? Someone will say, ah, I love MCP1. They can't really say it, right? They'll just say something like that. Another one will say, I dope MCB1, right? And then all these other people will say different things. And now what I can do at the end is I can calculate the proportion of each letter at each site, right? And then that's going to give me these proportions. Like at, at one, everybody can say I, so we have uh, a proportion of one. Everybody says the same thing. Then at the second site, we have 0.4 of uh, L and 0.8 of O, etc., etc. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the most common a letter that was said, right, in this position, it's O, and I'm putting the proportion down here, and then what I'm doing is I'm changing the size of that letter to match the proportion that I find it, right? So what you have here is you have a consensus sequence, and you know that at the first nucleotide, everybody votes I, right? So the proportion is high, so we have a high, uh, a large capital, capital, a large letter here, in this case, only uh, two out of the uh, five people said V, but that was the only letter that was common. Uh, so we put that here, but make the letter small, saying that there is more deviation here. Does that make sense? How we can express a consensus sequence by changing the, the height of the letters? All right, so that's the consensus sequence, and there is a little study question that asks you to take the consensus sequence for a, a protein um, a transcription factor and go on to a website and create a motif logo because that's what we call we call these things motif logos so go ahead and do that it's kind of a fun exercise I love actually looking at consensus sequences um, it's cute it's colorful all right so there are different sigma factors that recognize different sequences okay
So in, in bacteria, this is the general sigma factor. What it does, it, it binds and recognizes the sequences at the minus 35 or minus 10 region of the promoter for a lot of housekeeping genes. Housekeeping genes are basically making the cells run, right? So these are genes that are required for all the time, like RNA polymerase, the ribosomal genes, et cetera, et cetera, right? Most genes that are expressed in replicating happy cells. So it recognizes the sequences at this, at this, uh, in promoters of these uh, genes. Here's another alpha factor, uh, sigma factor. So this sigma factor is called sigma 54, and it's a sigma factor that's specialized for the transcription of a group of genes that are required for nitrogen metabolism, okay? So it's specialized to recognize and bind to sequences that are different at the promoter of these genes, okay? So these nitrogen genes. Will these nitrogen genes, do you think, are going to be bound by uh, sigma 70? No, right? Because their sequences look a lot different. Their, their sequences look a lot different from the sequences that are recognized by sigma 70, right? By diff having different sigma proteins, recognizing different sequences, you can code which sigma proteins are going to activate which genes, right? So that's gene regulation, and that's being done here by the sigma factor. Make sense? This is, ex sigma factors are exclusive to prokaryotic cells. However, in eukaryotic cells, the concept is exactly the same. You have transcription factors, and a transcription factor is going to have specific targets, and it's going to choose its targets because these targets are going to have DNA sequences in their promoters or regulatory regions that are going to be bound by that transcription factor, right? Same idea, but... It's the in, in, uh, same concept, but sigma factors are in, in prokaryotic cells. Any questions? Yes? What are the ends? The ends, yeah. So sometimes the, the sequence has absolutely no, um, uh, it, it deviates so many, in so many ways equally. As you can have equal chance of finding A's and the T's and the G's and the C's. Then we write N, anything. Anything goes for that side. Any questions? All right. So sigma factor is, also, is a general fact, transcription factor. We also call them basal transcription factor. And we call sigma factor also an initiation factor. The reason why it's called an initiation factor is that it is required for the initiation of transcription. But after the RNA polymerase starts transcribing, elongating, it gets kicked out. Okay, so it no longer goes along with the RNA polymerase. It doesn't complex with it and moves along with it. So it's called an initiation factor. And we have many, many of these in eukaryotic transcription that we're going to talk about in the le next lecture. So I said uh, the second phase of transcription we came to is elongation. And in this case, the polymerase basically goes down from 3' prime to 5', prime catalyzing the RNA synthesis from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So this is the nascent RNA. That's the new RNA that's being synthesized by adding RNTPs to the growing RNA. How does it actually look? It looks something like this. So this is uh, a crystal structure um, depiction of the complex. Like I said, a lot of polymerases look like a, uh, like a hand holding the nucleotide, in the nucleotide uh, uh, holding the DNA in the middle. And here, the template is shown in red, and the non-template is shown in blue. If you take that complex and tilt it a little bit so you can peek into the catalytic site, what you're going to see is in elongating RNA polymerases that are tightly bound to DNA. They have an open uh, uh, bubble here, transcription bubble, and they have the nucleotides coming in and added in this, this region and the growing chain of RNA is being kicked out from the side of the polymerase. All right, we said holding on is tight, is, is clamping tight. What would happen if it didn't? So what would happen if elongating RNA polymerase could not hold on tight? Exactly, it would just fall off the DNA, right? So, 
we talked about, a little bit about this. So what do we call that property of the enzyme? RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases. Processivity. Processivity, excellent. So that's how much it can, the ability of an enzyme to catalyze consecutive reactions without releasing the, its substrate. That's processivity, okay? So what enzyme did we learn about that, that is not so good at this, that doesn't have a very good processivity? Reverse transcriptase. Or F2. Or F, oh, was it one or two? I think it was one, right? The retrotransposon, specifically the reverse transcriptase that is encoded by the retrotransposons while it's inserting itself uh, into the DNA. Check it at home if it's ORF1 or ORF2. I can't remember which one it, it, it is. But it's basically reverse transcriptases are pretty bad at this. Give me an enzyme that's pretty good at this. It's something that has really good processivity. How are genomes replicated? DNA polymerase, specifically the one on the lagging strand, right? It's going on and on and on, kilobases long, and it's not falling off, right? It has a very high processivity. Very good. All right, transcription termination. So elongation continues until it comes to a site where it needs to actually dissociate it from, dissociate. Sorry, what you just said, on the lagging strand? Oh, sorry, leading strand. Okay. Very good. Thank you for correcting me. Absolutely, on the leading strand. The lagging strand is short and short, like short, little short pieces, right? Okay. Absolutely, that's right, L uh, the leading strand. So with the lagging strand, does the DNA polymerase just go for a little bit and then come off, so does it have lower processivity? Um, so the, the lagging strand polymerases <coughs> are actually special. The, the, the reason why lagging strand shorts is not necessarily due, due to its low processivity. It's because that lagging strand length is regulated by uh, a lot of the other uh, pr uh, enzymes that are involved, like primase and the, 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 the pr proteins that remove the little RNA primer, etc. The reason is you don't want to make those lagging uh, strand lengths too much so that it would uncouple from the re replication fork, okay? So it's not necessarily processivity that's regulating it. It's a really highly regulated process by other proteins. Any questions? <coughs> All right. So the transcription has to e end at some point, right? And that point is at the end of the gene. So how does this occur in prokaryotes? So in prokaryotes, you have this remarkable enzyme, which is called a rho factor, okay? So this is a hexameric protein. There are six of the same protein over and over again form that like really nice donut shape. And what happens is that in this donut shape, you have uh, it's about 70 to 80 base pair of the growing RNA transcript wraps. So when it's wrapped around here, which is not shown in this picture, it activates an ATPase activity of this row factor. So what it does is that it, it uses that ATBase activity to move and translocate along the growing RNA. So what happens is that you have transcription starting, RNA polymerase binds to this gene, promoter, starts the transcription, and you can see the growing uh, RNA in, in this like little red line here. And what the rho factor does, it, it attaches itself to the end of the RNA, so this RNA wraps around it, that initiates, that activates its ATBase activity that pushes, so the protein starts pushing itself along the RNA at a given speed. Uh, at a given speed. When the RNA polymerase pauses for certain reasons, for example, the presence of secondary structures in the DNA or regions that are a little bit harder to replicate, such as uh, a lot of repeat sequences, etc. The RNA polymerase pauses. Once it figures out what to do, it can continue. What that pausing does, it gives a chance to the rho, and, uh, rho factor to catch up. Okay? <coughs> and the rho factor, when it catches up at a place where the RNA polymerase is paused, 
it uses an RNA helicase activity of itself, the row factor itself, and it and unwinds the DNA RNA hybrid, right? And that will basically release the growing chain of RNA from the DNA. And so the transcription will end. Does it make sense? So there, um, it is a question that's not fully answered in vivo. In vitro, so in tube, when you mix of RNA polymerase with DNA, etc., certain structures in the DNA um, um, mistakes, in, uh, like the damage in the DNA, like T-dimers, any adducts, uh, any bases that doesn't, any nucleotides that doesn't have a base. All of these things actually slow the RNA polymerase a little bit, and it pauses. Sometimes it recovers, sometimes it collapses. In vivo, the rate of this is not very well known. A lot of people actually work on this because you don't want to um, you don't want to have a lot of polymerase that, that are paused or collapsed, and now you'll have these little short transcripts that are good for nothing, right? So it's only in cases for genes that have evolved to terminate their transcription in this way. And these genes do have sites that people realize that tend to pause the RNA polymerase so the row factor can catch up. It doesn't happen in all genes. So there are other genes that are trans their transcription ends in a row independent way. Okay, and we're going to talk about that next. But here's a question for you. Now that you know that this process depends on the row factor catching up, let's imagine that you isolated a row mutant that slows down its migration along RNA. So the row factor is migrating along this this newly synthesized RNA a lot slower than it should. What effect would you predict on the transcription of this particular gene? Mm -hmm. It might not be able to catch up this RNA polymerase, and this, if this RNA polymerase can rescue itself from this pause and continue, what would happen is that you would have longer transcripts, right? Because row factor is going to need time to catch up. Does that make sense? What if it was a row factor that has a mutation that makes it really go fast? What would you predict? A lot shorter, a lot shorter transcripts because it would catch up and uh, unwind the RNA-DNA hybrid and then you'll stop early. Any questions? No? All right. <coughs> Okay, so here is a mechanism by which the transcription can end in a row-independent way, okay? So in this row-independent transcription termination, what you have is you have at the end of the genes, you have a special uh, sequences that, uh, th that we call the termination sequences, and it has two characteristic features. One feature is a stretch of A's, at A nucleotides, uh, at the, um, where the transcription is going to end. And the second feature is a GC-rich uh, self-complementary region. So you have these two inverted repeats that can basically form a, um, a, uh, a hairpin, right, like this. Uh, wait. So these sequences, you can see, that are complementary to each other. So you can have a hairpin with a little bit of intervening sequence here. You're going to have C here and G here, um, C here and G here, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And then a stretch of A's. Okay? So that, 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 um, an, an inverted repeat that can form a hairpin. So that hairpin actually forms in the RNA. So as the as these sequences are being transcribed into RNA, so you have this RNA transcript, and you can see that the, uh, there's the sequence here, that's the first in inverted repeat, and the second inverted repeat here. And what they can do is they can form this RNA hairpin, okay? 
So the RNA polymerase, when it's holding its template and a growing chain of RNA, it has a certain conformation that holds that, uh, that best when the RNA does not have any secondary structures, right? When the RNA is nice and, and straight like this, let's say it's, it's like a little, um, uh, like a, a pencil, okay? When this hairpin occurs too close to the RNA polymerase, it basically pokes the RNA polymerase on one end, and it destabilizes how tight it can hold, okay? So that destabilizes how tight the RNA polymerase is holding, and at the same time, remember, the bonds between A's and uh, U's are much um, less strong compared to G's and C's, um, etc. right? So that bond holding the DNA-RNA duplex is going to, to fall apart, and what will happen is that it's going to release the, the uh, growing RNA molecule from the DNA. Does that make sense? So you have a hairpin structure that kicks out the RNA polymerase, kind of makes it wiggly, it's not holding on very well, and then you have a stretch of A and U's that are not bonding really well either, so everything falls apart, and that's how the transcription ends. All right, so that was basically the mechanics of how this thing works, right? How does transcription works? Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about gene regulation in prokaryotes. And one of the things that you've learned many times is that genes in prokaryotes are organized on these things, what we call operons. Operons are basically this stretch of DNA where they only have a single promoter, so single transcription start site, for a lot of different genes that encode for separate functional products, separate proteins. Okay? So in this case, we're looking at a trip operon in the E. coli genome. It has the genes E, D, C, B, and A that are important for tryptophan synthesis. And they have a single transcription start site for the trip mRNA. Once it's going to be transcribed, it's going to produce a single uh, mRNA. So this mRNA, we call it polycystronic because it, has, it contains more than one gene, in the information for more than one gene, and that has start sites for protein, separate start sites for protein synthesis. So when they are independently translated, you're going to have different proteins that are coming out. Make sense? All right, so in bacteria, different bacteria, there are about 50% of the, their genes are organized into operons. They are usually functionally related genes. They're co-transcribed, then translated into individual proteins, and they're mostly polycystronic. That means more than one gene is on one RNA. For example, we saw this tryptophan uh, operon. Interestingly, they're more common in prokaryotes, but you can still find them in eukaryotes, right? So operons can also be seen in eukaryotes. Uh, typically, again, there's a single RNA. But in this case, in the case of the eukaryotes, instead of translating the products into separate genes, what they do is they take that single RNA and process it into separate RNAs. So they transcribe a single RNA, then process that RNA to get it cut into the separate RNAs. So they're called monocystronic. So each RNA is going to have its own gene. Okay? So we talked about a kind of operon in human genome. Any guess for what it was? We learned about a functional product, a set of functional products that are transcribed from a single site as a single RNA, and then gets processed. Ribosomal, ribosomal genes, right? They are in a tandem cluster. They have, you have the different ribosomal genes right next to each other. They're transcribed together and then chopped up into to fragments. As for retrotransposon, I am not sure if they're organized as an operon or not. You're thinking really well because they, are, they have an origin that's from viruses. It is a possibility that they have 
if they have more than one ORF, more than one coding region, they might be transcribed into a single um, RNA. And thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense because what you're going to do is you're going to take that single RNA and insert it somewhere else in the genome, right? And if there are, if if it is if it has more than one product, it has to be an opera, right? Very good guess, excellent guess. All right, any questions? All right. So this is an organism that I love. It's a model organism. It's a little worm of about 1,000 cells and about 100 megabase genome. It's a eukaryote. It's an animal. It eats. It runs around. It looks for food. It runs away bad from bad smells. It does a lot of things that an animal does. And interestingly, 15% of its genes are encoded from operon. So unlike the prokaryotes, most of the time, these genes are not functionally related. So the logic behind why putting these things in the same operon is not that clear. And some of are, are, are what we call in hybrid operons. So they do have a single transcription start site, but they also have independent promoters. So what you see is that so often what you'll find is that you, you'll find RNA, um, um, RNA products that are going to be a single product that is going to contain, for example, the RNA for two genes. Okay, But because there is a single promoter here, that's transcribing that, sometimes what you see is you have independent promoters so you can find these uh, that they are independently transcribed from each other. So they're hybrid operons. They have a choice to do either. Questions? All right. OK, so let's continue on uh, looking at the trypt tryptophan operon, OK? so. So the, uh, the tryptophan operon is regulated by a repressor protein called trip repressor. When there is a lot of tryptophan in the media, the bacteria does not need to make the enzymes that are needed to make tr more tryptophan, right? They can simply take it from the environment. So what they, they do is they repress the expression of this operon. So they have a trip repressor that binds to the region of the the DNA uh, that's upstream of uh, upstream right next to the promoter, that region of the DNA is called the operator. So the operator in bacteria is the DNA in bacteria that controls the transcription of an adjacent gene. And in this case, the operator is bound by the trip repressor. And the promoter is the region of the DNA that directs RNA polymerase to be bind and begin transcription. All right. So the trip repressor is a transcription factor. So we define transcription factors as proteins that bind to gene regulatory sites. Gene regulatory sites are sites in the DNA that regulates the expression of genes. So is promoter a gene regula regulatory site? Yes, right? it's controlling. Is operator a gene regulatory site? Yes, it is controlling, right? It is the regions of the DNA that control gene expression, gene regulatory sites. So these transcription factors bind to these sites to either activate, in this case we'll call it activator, or repress, in this case we'll call it, very imaginatively, repressor. Right? And then they will repress through various mechanisms. All right, the, in the case of tryptophan, what happens? So you have the tryptophan promoter here, this is the operator here. Interestingly, that operator sequences are found right in between where the signal factor is going to come and recognize a minus 35 and minus 10 sequences. Okay? So in the case of low tryptophan, this operon needs to be transcribed. So what you have is you have an inactive repressor. So this rep repressor protein is there, but it's inactive. That means unable to bind to the DNA. Okay? And when it's unable to bind the DNA, the sigma factor is going to come and bind to these uh, sequences and bring this whole holo enzyme, and the enzyme is going to start transcription. In the presence of tryptophan from the, the environment, the tryptophan is inside the cells, 
And what it does, it binds to this uh, repressor and it changes its conformation. So it puts it in a, in, a, uh, in a protein conformation that is capable of binding to this operator. And it binds to this operator at a, a, a very strongly, right? So it has a very low KD. It's holding on pretty tight. And what it does is it physically prevents the RNA polymerase to come and bind here and start transcription. Does that make sense? The repressor acting like a physical barrier to transcription initiation. How does this actually look? Um, it's this beautiful crystal structure of the trip repressor. It is, uh, is a zymer. The tryptophan is shown here in red, binds to the repressor at a site that's not close to its uh, DNA binding site. So it's an allosteric site that's away from where it recognizes the DNA. But its binding uh, changes the, the, the repressor conformation so that it can bind to DNA. So the recognition of the helices right here interact with the bases in the major groove. So this is the major groove, right? And this is the minor groove of the DNA. But the trip repressor also make interactions with the backbone of the DNA. You can see here that there are other alpha helices that are making connections uh, with the backbone and not the bases. So here's a question for you. Which one of these interactions do you expect it to be sequence specific? The interactions of the recognition alpha helices or the other interactions? recognition alpha helices because they interact with the bases in the major groove of the DNA, right? And these bases are going to be A, T, G, or C. And the structure of the repressor is formed in such way that it will interact with certain sequences and not the others, right? It's going to recognize A or a T and a, not, and a G or a C. Does that make sense? And the other interactions are going to be with the sugar phosphate backbone, stabilizing this whole DNA protein complex so that it can bind strongly together. Does it make sense? All right. Okay, so now that was the trip operon uh, regulation. It's done by a single protein called the trip repressor, and here's our favorite example of bacterial gene regulation, which is the lac operon, which depends on both a repressor and an activator for its transcription regulation. All right, so what's a lac operon? It is the, uh, the, the operon that con contains genes uh, that are required for the breaking of the lactose into galactose and glucose and the metabolism of that. The bacteria activates the transcription of the lac operon when the glucose is finished in the media and it has an option to have to use uh, lactose. And so it contains genes that is encoding for beta-galactosidase. It's the enzyme that, that does this. It encodes a gene, uh, a permease, that's the transporter. So you can transport lactose into the cells. And then you have a, another gene called transacetylase increases the specificity of the transporter for the lactose. All right, so you got to turn this thing on when there's no sugar. So how's this organized again? What you have here is that you have uh, the transcription start site that is right uh, uh, near the uh, operator. So this operator sequence is the sequence where it is bound by the lactic repressor. And this is the promoter sequences, and it has another sequence here uh, called the cap site that is bound by the activator protein called cap. Here's a question. Is cap site a regulatory region? Yes. Yes. It controls, right? All right. So in the, uh, in the presence of glucose and no lactose, in the cells, the presence of glucose leads to low cyclic AMP levels. So what happens is that you have your lac repressor that comes and binds to its operator, recognizes and binds to the operator sequences, and that physically prevents the sigma 70 to bind to the promoter and start recruiting the RNA polymerase complex, right? 
So you're gonna have no transcription. Does it make sense? So far, very similar to the trip repressor mechanism. In the case of in, in, in environment where there is some glucose, so the cyclic AMP levels are still low in the cells, and then some lactose, so there would be an advantage to, to use this lactose a little bit, what happens is that the lactose binds to the lac repressor and changes its conformation so it no longer binds to the operator, okay? So in this case, is it similar to the trip uh, repressor in which the trip binding induces the binding of the repressor to the DNA? In some ways, it's similar because it something a ligand binds and changes the conformation of the protein, but the, the result is exactly the opposite. In this case, when lactose binds to the repressor, it removes it off of the DNA, right? It's not capable of binding the DNA when there is lactose present. So what happens is that the repression is released a little bit. Now you no longer have the repressor. The sigma factor can bind and bring the RNA polymerase, and then you have some transcription. However, from the lac operon, you're going to have low transcription because it's a weak promoter. If it was a strong promoter, you, what would happen? when you remove the lactose, lac repressor? Would you have higher transcription or lower transcription? Higher, right? And so here's a, another question. Based on this information, can you tell me if the lac promoter deviates more or less from the consensus sequence at minus 35 and minus 10? Does it deviate more or deviate less? Does it look more like the consensus sequence or less like the consensus sequence? Less, less right? Because it's a weak promoter. Right? The sigma factor is going to come and bind. It doesn't like those sequences that much. It's like, it's like I'll, just, I'll just go for it, but I don't like it so much. It likes the consensus sequences a lot more than it makes a strong promoter. All right, so that's, the, uh, that's what happens in the presence of glucose and, and lactose. All right, what if the glucose actually in the media finishes? What happens is that the, the cyclic AMP levels in the cells go up, so you have high cyclic AMP. And what happens is that this cyclic AMP binds to the cap protein and again changes its conformation so that it can bind to the cap site. When the cap protein binds to the cap site, it physically interacts with the RNA polymerase so that it stabilizes its recruitment and binding the promoter so more RNA polymerase can come and bind strongly and start transcription. And in this case, it activates transcription so you have a lot more transcription here, right? Does it make sense? All right. So how does, it act, how does lac repressor actually look like? It looks like this. It acts as a tetramer. So you, it binds to two independent operator sequences. One is at the promoter. So this is, for example, is at the promoter. And then another operator sequence that's a little bit upstream of the promoter. And you have a dimer of the lac repressor. So each of these is, is a monomer. So you have one protein in green, one protein in uh, orange and they dimerize that there is a region of the protein that makes very close contacts with each other and dimerizes, right? And now you have these alpha helices again binding to the major groove of the DNA and lightly making these uh, contacts both with the DNA uh, backbone and with the bases here. It also makes contacts with the, the minor groove. And then you have a region of this uh, dimer that is sticking out, and what it does is it makes contacts with another lac repressor dimer, which we, uh, and makes a tetramer, right? So you have a stable tetramer protein that is recognizing two operator sequences. All right, so why are there additional operators near the, uh, near the, um, the, the promoter? <coughs> so in, um, in E. coli, uh, there are about four, um, um, there, there are two operator uh, sequences, 
actually there are three operator sequences here is shown the, as the tetramer is binding to two of them one is at the promoter and the other one is upstream uh, uh, downstream of the, uh, the the gene and then another one upstream of the gene so what is a, additional operators do is they increase the local concentration of the lac repressor. So you know that the transcription factor binding DNA is just like a chemical reaction, right? You have DNA, you have protein, they bind with a certain KD, right? So at a given time, if your dissociation constant is low, you're going to have a high amount of uh, protein plus DNA. Um, if, uh, if that KD is, is high, that you're going to have low. Another way to increase the amount of protein binding to DNA is you increase the concentration of the protein, right? So the more lac repressors you have in the cell, the more you're going to have the repressor binding to the DNA. But in E. coli cells, there's a given concentration of the lac repressor. You don't want to make too much, right? And what you do is you increase the local concentration of the repressor around the DNA area. So in E. coli cells, for a given cell, there are about 10 lac repressor tetramers. So because of the presence of this OT and O3, which is the operator 2 and 3, there's always a lac repressor close by to O1. Uh, uh, if, if these repressors uh, were freely diffusing, that is not holding on to these O2 and O3 for a given amount of time, then you would have less chances of these repressor binding to the first operator. So imagine this is kind of like a big room, big empty room, okay? And you have a puppy. It's a really excited puppy, and you want the puppy to stay close to one corner, okay? So puppy is the repressor kind of freely diffusing inside the, inside the cell, inside the room. What you would do is, what you want the puppy to play with a chew toy that you attach to the corner, right? And you always want that puppy to come to that chew toy. What you do is, what you do is you put a couple of other chew toys be, uh, that's close by, right? So when puppy leaves that one chew toy, instead of going wandering around in the, the empty room, it's going to stay close and hold on to the other one. And when it releases, it, it's going to say, hey, that's the one that I was playing with first and then go on and play with that one, right? So it increases the local concentration of the repressor around the operator area, just like you would increase the local concentration of that puppy around the chew toy, okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. So how do these... Okay, we learned that repressors can like basically sit in the place where the RNA polymerase is going to come and physically prevent the polymerase to come and start transcription. How do activators actually work? The way that the activators work is they make physical interactions with the RNA polymerase complex to increase their stability and binding to the promoter, and that increases its chances of turning into an open, open complex and start transcription. So here's the structure of the cap activator here, and it's making very close contacts with the alpha subunit of the uh, RNA polymerase uh, here, um, um, uh, uh, of the RNA polymerase, basically physically interacting with the RNA polymerase to, to, to recruit. So recruit is like kind of hold on to the protein by these physical interactions so that it can be stable. All right, so here's some terminology that you're going to hear for the rest of your lives if you stay in molecular biology in gene, about gene regulation, okay? So you'll hear people talking about negative regulation of transcription and positive regulation of transcription. So what we have here in negative regulation is that you have a bound repressor protein. So negative regulation is mediated by a repressor protein. And there are two things a repressor protein can do, right? We learned that there could be a, a ligand that can bind to a repressor protein and remove that repressor protein from the promoter or the operator, and that would turn the gene off. What kind of uh, repressor did we learn does this? Bound to a ligand and gets off the lac repressor, right? 
or you can have a repressor that can bind to a ligand and that can change its conformation to recognize and bind to the DNA. What kind of repressor do we learn? Trip repressor, right? Negative regulation does not mean simply repression of gene. You can have a negative regulation mechanism that can turn genes on or off. What it means, it, it depends on the action of a repressor. Okay? Make sense? Because you use a trip repressor to turn the genes on or off, right? The trip repressor turns the gene off when it's bound, but when it's unbound, so there's a mechanism to, to release it, then you turn the genes on, okay? So you depend on a repressor, but you can turn genes on and off. So negative re regulation can result in both activation and repression. It simply refers that the regulation is achieved through a repressor. All right. A positive regulation of transcription then is the opposite. That is the mechanism that depends on an activator to regulate the transcription. So you have, in this case, uh, for example, a, the cap protein, which is an activator that makes interaction with RNA polymerase and ha has it transcribed. And if you have the cap protein bound, you have transcription. If you have the cap protein removed, for example, by the addition of a ligand, um, then you never you you don't have the RNA polymerase binding as strongly, right? And this is the mechanism that we learned how the cap protein works. When there's a lot of cyclic AMP, it binds to the cap and changes its conformation so that it binds to the promoter, so that you can have the lack uh, lack operator transcri transcribing at a high level. So here's a question. Is uh, trip operon positively or negatively regulated? Negative. Negatively. What about LAC operon? Both. Both. Both, right? It has cap and repressor. Very good. All right, so far, all the mechanisms that we learned about what we call one component mechanism. There is a single protein that senses a ligand, the presence of a ligand, binds to it directly and binds to the DNA. There's a single component, okay? There's a single protein. There are other mechanisms in bacteria which we call two com component regulatory mechanisms. In this case, you have two proteins. One senses and binds to a ligand, and the other one binds to the DNA. And they have to, to, to uh, um, communicate, okay? How does that occur? So that occurs through a, a, a phosphorylation event. So this is an example for the regulation of glutamine synthase gene. So what you have here is a two-component system that has two proteins that are involved, NTRB and NTRC. At these high glutamine levels, you don't want any transcription of glutamine synthase. What happens is that at high glutamine levels, the NTRB protein is bound to the glutamine, and that makes a conformation of the protein so that the second domain in the protein, which is a histidine kinase transmitter domain, to be inactive, okay? So we call this the sensor domain because it senses the glutamine levels by binding to it, and then this is the histidine kinase transmitter domain. And then the second protein is a transcription factor, which is a, called NTRC. It has a regulatory domain that has a amino acid here shown, aspartic acid. And then it has a DNA binding domain, and that's the domain of the protein that directly binds to the DNA. So at low glutamine levels, the transcription of this glutamine synthase need to be activated. So what happens is that when the glutamine is released from the sensor, domain of NTRB that leads to a conformational change in the protein that makes the histidine kinase transmitter domain active. When this kinase domain, kinase is a domain that puts phosphorylation, right, is active, what it does, it, it phosphorylates is itself at this histidine amino acid. So it puts the phosphate group at the histidine amino acid. It's also called a transmitter domain because it does something very curious that takes that phospho group from the histidine and transmits it to the aspartic acid in the transcription factor NTRC. Okay? So that's how they're communicating it. Phosphorylates itself 
and then takes the phosphor group and puts it into the, into the aspartic acid. Now, that phosphorylation leads to a conformational change in the NTRC protein, transcription factor, and it releases the DNA binding domain to be capable of now binding to the gene regulatory region of uh, glutamine synthase. Okay? Does this make sense? All right. What, is, what do you think is the advantage of a two-component system over a one-component system in bacteria? Why have a two-component system? You basically have an indirect way of relaying the information to the DNA. What kind of things the cell need to sense? things that, there, that are in its environment, right? Some of things, these things will be transported through the membrane inside the cells, right? And these, 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 type, of, um, uh, these type of little chemicals, the, the cell can get away with a single component system if it can sense, bind the thing, and then have the protein bind to the DNA, right? But what if the signal that you want to sense is outside the cell? right, in the environment, and let's say that chemical or signal that you want to sense cannot cross the membrane, then you have a problem, right? You need a protein that's going to sense that signal and then go and bind to the DNA. So in the two component systems, that, the solution that, to that problem is solved by having a lot of these kind of sensor and kinase domain containing proteins being membrane proteins and their sensor domains are sensing things that are in outside the cell, right? And then when it's bound, the, the kinase domain, which is inside the cell, can relay the information to the transcription factor, which can now is free to go and bind to the DNA, right? So if you look at a lot of these two component systems, the first component are mostly contain transmembrane domains them, in themselves. So this is how you can sense think, oh, yeah, this must be probably a two-component two system. Make sense? Any questions? All right, so what happens when this transcription factor is released, NTRC? It goes and binds to the gene regulatory region of the glin A promoter <coughs> upstream, okay? So this is a little bit uncommon for prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, these type of gene regulatory elements are very common, and we're going to talk a lot about them. They're called enhancers. Rather than being right next to the promoter, right, like a cap site or an operator site, they're found hundreds of base pairs away from the promoter. So they're physically away. So which we call these enhancer sequences. These are sequences in the DNA that are bound by gene regulatory proteins, but they are not necessarily very close to the promoter. So a pair of phosphorylated NTRC dimers bind to this enhancer region of the glin A promoter. And this glin A promoter is bound by a sigma factor that's a little bit special. We talked about sigma 70, which is the housekeeping sigma that can bind and recruit the RNA polymerase. Everybody's ready to go. It goes and transcribes. Sigma 54 is a special sigma factor. It actually can recruit the polymerase, but it does not promote the transcription start until it can make a contact with the, uh, the NTRC transcription factor in three dimension, forming this loop, right? that beautiful loop, which you can see under a microscope. Here's the NTRC dimers bound to the, pro uh, the enhancer. Here's the RNA polymerase bond with sigma 54, and only when they get together, then it starts transcription, because the NTRC uh, has an ATP-dependent um, activity that can release the RNA polymerase to start transcription, okay? So NTRC basically facilitates the transition between the initial binding of the RNA polymerase plus sigma to the uh, formation of an initiating complex and that requires ATP, which is unusual for bacterial transcription, but that's pretty much the norm for eukaryotic transcription. All right. So these prokaryotic enhancers, they're basically short 
usually 100 base pairs of DNA that are bound by transcription factors, they regulate transcription, they can be far away and act in either direction. What does that mean? You take the 100 base pair sequence fragment, you reverse it and insert it back in the same site, it will work just as well. Because the way that interacts with the promoter is by looping, it can loop in either direction. Okay? So its direction is not necessarily um, um, specifying its activity. Here's a question. Can prokaryotic promoters act in either direction? If you take the promoter, switch it around, would it act the same way? No. The reason for that is that there are sequences that are bound by the sigma factor that positions the RNA polymerase to the plus one correctly. If you reverse these sequences, what is going to happen? Transcription is going to start the other way, right? It's going to go the other way because you basically took a directional RNA polymerase, switched it around, it's positioning, and then that guy has no, knows no better, right? And it's going to go and transcribe the other direction. Does that make sense to everyone? That was a midterm question from last year, too. So try to think about these concepts a little bit and do the study questions as well. <clears throat> All right, so that was transcription initiation. You can, a lot of gene regulation occurs at the level of transcription for prokaryotes, whether or not you want to turn on a gene or turn off a gene. Some regulatory mechanisms occur after transcription initiates, okay? So this is the mechanism in, in the trip operon again. So the trip operon has another mechanism of regulation, which we call attenuation. So here's what happens. This is specific to prokaryotes, where transcription and translation are occurring at the same time, okay? All right, so what do you have here? <laughs> Uh, at the high level of tryptophan, you actually don't want the transcription to start and continue. Sometimes the transcription will start, okay? And at the beginning of the operon, there is a region of the mRNA which we called, uh, called the, uh, the, the, the trip leader, okay? Encodes for the trip leader. So, as the, so this is your RNA polymerase. So it comes into the promoter, okay? And it starts transcription. And it starts transcription so that as it goes along, right, it's going to make some RNA. And so that's the, the RNA shown here. And here's the DNA. As this RNA is made, because the translation also is happening at the same time, it recruits the polymerase, okay? So you have horrible, my horrible drawing of a, a ribosome, sorry. It recruits the ribosome, and the ribosome is going to start translating, and so that's your protein. That's your RNA. So that's your mRNA, that's your protein. So this trip leader sequence is interesting because it contains a lot of codons that uh, need the tryptophan amino acid, okay? So when the ribosome comes to this region called region 1, which contains a lot of trip up, uh, codons, and there is not much tryptophan around, what is going to happen? It's look, looking for tRNAs containing tryptophan, but there's not much around it. What's going to happen to that ribosome? It's going to wait going to stall, right? It's going to pause. It doesn't have the required amino acids to incorporate, and it pauses. What that accomplishes is that it, when it pauses, it, its footprint, so the, the region that it covers in the mRNA is long enough that it covers a second region called region 2, and you have the RNA that is made, which contains uh, two other regions, region 3 and region 4. And the sequences of these regions are such that they, can, they are an inverted repeat, right? And they fold around and make a hairpin, okay? And when the hairpin happens, and the trip leader also is followed, the hairpin is followed by a stretch of, of, of A's, right? How does that look like to you? What kind of transcription termination mechanism does that look like to you? 
row independent termination, right? What do you have? You have the two features that you have. You have RNA polymerase that's really close to a um, to a stretch of use and a hairpin, right? So when that happens, the RNA polymerase gets destabilized and falls off. So even though it starts the transcription, in the absence of the tryptophan, due to our, the, the ribosome, the position of the ribosome and the sequences in the mRNA, the RNA polymerase falls off. Okay, so it doesn't continue very well. So perfect. What happens when you have uh, when you have low le um, Sorry, okay, I confused the previous slide. So this is when the, um, so this is when happens with the low levels of tryptophan, where the, uh, uh, sorry, this happens when there's high levels of tryptophan, so you don't want to, to transcribe the trip operon. What happens is that the ribosome uh, sees the trip codons and incorporates the trip amino acids, and it continues and covers the region too, okay? So what I just said before is, is not because the ribosome is pausing, it's actually continuing into region two, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let me try and draw this up. All right, so what you have is, is here, you have your mRNA, and you have a lot of tri triplets here, right? Uh, nucleotides that are encoding for the trip codon. And what you have is that you have the ribosome come in here, and the ribosome is big. It covers this um, region one and incorporates the uh, trip amino acids to the growing chain of the, the protein, right? So trip, let's go and put in trip. And because its footprint is covering this called a region two, which has a sequence that is complementary to region three and region four. So it has a sequence, let's say G, 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 and the region three has a C, C, C. It can make a hairpin. So this has the potential of making a hairpin. But because it is covered by this uh, ribosome, what happens is that this region three cannot make a hairpin with region two, so it makes a hairpin with region four, okay? So that's the hair, hairpin that you see here. So the RNA region three is making a hairpin with uh, region four, and that's right upstream of a stretch of use that release the RNA polymerase, just like it would happen in a row independent transcription termination. In the absence of uh, tryptophan, what happens is what I was saying first, which you should just never mind. Uh, what happens is that the ribosome stalls, and it is that stalling occurs at a region, it's upstream of the, the region two, right? So instead of ribosome moving in the direction, it basically gets stalled over here, right? Over here, because there is no trip codon, uh, there's, there's no tryptophan, so it can't add the, the trip to the peptide. It's looking for a trip, but there's nothing around, so it pauses. But that pausing occurs right upstream of that uh, region two, so that region two is now capable of making a hairpin with region three. Now, that hairpin is actually away from the RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase, because there's a lot of room, region four is released, RNA polymerase is here. The, this hairpin is not close enough to the stretch of use, okay? So you have your, your use here. And that is not enough to dis destabilize the RNA polymerase so the RNA polymerase can continue. Does that make sense? Exactly. When the ribosome comes in, it comes to the first region. If there's tryptophan, it can cover the second, and that will basically form a hairpin that's going to stop transcription. It, 
when there is no tryptophan, it comes into region 4. It can't cover region 2. Now there is transcription. There is a study question about this, so go ahead and try that out if you haven't gotten it. Okay? All right.